Okay, <clears throat> so we set up this uh, problem in the last video where we wanted to take a surface integral um, over the fun of the function x squared plus y squared plus z squared ds over the uh, cylinder that was broken up into these three parts, s1, s2, and s3. Um, this is a very long problem, and uh, that tends to be the case anytime we're doing surface integrals of piecewise smooth surfaces made up of you know more than one piece, more than one surface. So I went ahead and did this um, problem ahead of time just to kind of streamline it a little bit and I can talk through the steps. Um, so the very first thing I, I did is I, I started with the surface S1, the side of the cylinder, and I parametrized my surface. Um, and in this, in this example, I'm instead of using a U and a V, I'm using a theta and a Z. Um, Felt like it made sense to call them that uh, at the time, but then I, I, I revert back to using U's and V's when I go to the S2 and S3. Um, it's just kind of a personal choice, I guess. So uh, parametrization for the side of the cylinder. If you project the cylinder into the um, into the xy plane, you get a circle, and it's the circle x squared plus y squared equals nine. So that gives me the standard parametrization for the i and j components here. 3 cosine of theta i plus 3 sine of theta j. Um, z is just going to be z. So um, th I get this plus zk here. z goes from 0 to 2, theta goes from 0 to 2 pi. That would be the parametrization for that cylinder. And we've seen that parametrization in the past. Um, so the next thing I need to do is find the partial derivatives of this of r of theta z with respect to theta and respect and with respect to z. That gives me those tangent vectors. Um, this is r of theta, negative three sine of theta i plus three cosine of theta j. Um, r of z because the z only shows up in the k component is just k. So here's my cross product of those two vectors. I made a little mistake here, so you can see I kind of crossed a couple of things out, rewrote negative three sine of theta, th three cosine of theta. Um, but it's, it's just a cross product. When we evaluate this cross product, we get 3 cosine of theta i plus 3 sine of theta j. Now remember, what we need this for is its magnitude, because that's something that's going to show up in the integral. Magnitude of this, very conveniently, comes out to just be a constant. That's our favorite case is when that happens. Um, <clears throat> we end up with 3 as a result. So how do we evaluate the surface integral over this surface S1? Well, remember, x squared plus y squared plus z squared uh, is the function we're integrating, but we want to in, uh, um, integrate using a double integral in the z theta plane. So I need to convert everything to z's and thetas. Now, conveniently, we have this uh, description of our cylinder, x squared plus y squared equals 9. So I could either substitute 3 cosine of theta for x, 3 sine of theta for y, and simplify, or just use the fact that x squared plus y squared equals 9 to substitute 9 for the x squared plus y squared right here. Remember, my k component for my parametrization was just z, so this z remains a z, z squared, 9 plus z squared. And then I multiply by the 3 that we got from the magnitude of our cross product. There's the 3. Now, because the 3 is a constant, I can bring it straight out of the integral. Um, because there are no more thetas aside from the d theta in this integral, I can split this into a product of two integrals. Um, so now I have the integral from 0 to 2 pi of d theta, integral from 0 to 2 of the rest of my integrand 9 plus z squared. I integrated each of these separately, and I ended up with 124 pi as my result. Okay, I know I went through that super quick, um, and there is more to this problem because we have to deal with the other two surfaces. But hopefully, hopefully you can make sense of that. Now, the second surface, S2, you can see I made a couple other mistakes as I worked through this. You're going to make some mistakes as you go through these problems, I guarantee it. Um, what we need now is a parametrization for this upper disk of our cylinder that you can see right here. Um, so in order to uh, parametrize that, I know that the k component is going to equal 2 because uh, the, it, it's, it's in the plane z equals 2. Um, here, if I imagine this disk as containing all circles um, centered at the point 0, 0, 2 right here um, in the plane z equals 2. So basically, take this disk and think of it filling it up with concentric circles. 
then you get circles of radius 0 through 2, or sorry, 0 through 3 filling up this disk. So a way of parametrizing that is to use a standard parametrization for a circle, but the, where the radius of the circle would normally go, we, we assign the variable u to that, and then we just let u go from 0 to 3. So this gives me my parametrization for that upper disk, T, uh, S2. Here's my RU and my RV. I get cosine of VI plus sine of VJ for RU, and then RV is negative U sine of V plus U cosine of V. You notice we're kind of seeing very similar parametrizations show up over and over and over again. Um, hopefully that starts to you know, help in, in future problems, uh, just so you're not reinventing the wheel every time. Uh, we need the cross product of these. So when I evaluate this cross product, because this column has these two zeros here, my i and j components are both gonna be zero in this cross product, meaning I only have a k component, and after simplifying, it comes out to just u, k. So this time, my, my, uh, when I take my magnitude of that cross product, square root of u squared equals u, remember u is non-negative from our restriction, so I don't need absolute values here. Um, it's not a constant this time. It's, it's a variable, but it's not a bad, it's not, it's not that bad. So let's convert this to a double integral that we can evaluate. Here's where my, I get my limits of integration from, 0 to 3 for my u, 0 to 2 pi for my v, and I'm going to integrate with respect to u first, so I'm going to put that as my inner integral. Now I have to substitute the, the original parametrization directly. I plug this in for x, this in for y, this in for z. I'm squaring everything, right? Because it's x squared plus y squared plus z squared. So that gives me this. Um, these first two terms, after factoring the u squared out, simplifies to just u squared. Um, and then don't forget that the u that we get here has to be multiplied to our integrand. Um, scooch that up a little bit. So this, in parentheses, becomes u squared plus 4. Distributing the u in, it gives me u cubed plus 4u. And then in this case, the dv can be brought into this integral because there are no v's anywhere. Um, and now I'm evaluating these two integrals, another product of integrals. This one comes out to 153 pi over 2. Okay. Again, I'm going through this really, really fast, but because I'm recording this, you can go back and watch through steps if it, if it was too fast and it's not clear. Um, S3... You'll notice I do this little dot, dot, dot here. The reason I do that is because S3 is the lower disk of, uh, uh, of our um, cylinder. So it's going to be very, very similar steps to what we did for the upper disk. The parametrization is a little different. Uh, the lower disk is going to have a k component of 0 instead of 2. But the remaining steps after that are going to look pretty similar to what we just saw. So to keep this from taking forever to get through, um, I'm going to jump to the step where we end up with an answer. 81 pi over 2 is what we get here. I would encourage you to fill in these steps, though, if you're, if you're uncomfortable with me skipping them. So the end result of this is uh, that the original surface integral that we wanted to evaluate is just the sum of the three um, values that we just found. 124 pi plus 81 pi over 2 plus 153 pi over 2 is 241 pi. That would be the solution. These problems are very, very lengthy. Um, but we're going to see in the next couple of sections, when we talk about Stokes' theorem and uh, divergence theorem, oftentimes we can, we can make these problems take significantly less time by using those theorems. All right, so... Uh, okay, so this is where we started. I'm going to move past this now. All right, so our next goal here is to um, take what we're, we've been doing with surface integrals and move towards um, taking surface integrals of vector fields. This is analogous to what we do with line integrals. We talked about how to evaluate the line integral of a scalar field um, over some curve C, and then we took those ideas and applied them to uh, line integrals over vector fields and got some useful results out of that. So again, trying to repeat that same sort of idea, we need to think about how to how to extend these ideas into vector fields. So one of the things that was important when we talked about line integrals was the orientation of the curve that you uh, are using as your, uh, for, for the curve that you're integrating over. Um, 
the surfaces have a similar concept. We, what we need is something called an orientable surface. So basically a way to assign some orientation to a surface. And we do it using uh, a unit normal vector. But the, before we can talk about how exactly you orient a surface, you do have to see that there are surfaces that are not orientable, um, which are surfaces that we can't apply these concepts to, the surface, in, the surface integral stuff that we've been working on. So what does it mean for a um, surface to be orientable? Well, if you have a surface, then you can assign a, a normal vector to all of the points on that surface. And if you think of the normal vector as a function of uh, of x, y, and z, so that you could plug in points on a surface, the x, y, and z co uh, co coordinates, then we say that a uh, surface is orientable if that function n assigning normal vectors to these points is continuous. Now, I, I'm using the terminology varies continuously over s, but that means the same thing. That's difficult to check um, uh, directly. So instead we work with a more intuitive idea of what an orientable means. An orientable surface is one that has two distinct sides, a top and a bottom, so to, so to speak, or an inside and an outside. Um, most surfaces that you can imagine would have that. If I picked up this piece of paper, there's a top side to this paper and there's a bottom side to this paper. So this paper is an orientable surface. Um, but an example of a non-orientable surface is something you're probably familiar with, a Mobius strip. You can make a Mobius strip out of paper if you want. You cut a, a long strip of paper out, um, take one end and twist it 180 degrees, and then tape the two ends together. What ends up happening with a Mobius strip is if you run your finger along the inside of the strip, once you reach the twist, your finger is now going to be on the outside of the strip, and, and you'll be able to think of this as uh, a surface with only one side to it. Um, if you do that with normal vectors, take a, a, a point, say P here, and give it a normal vector. This normal vector is pointing inward towards this Mobius strip. If you move that point along and evaluate normal vectors along the way, eventually, because you end up on the other side, those normal vectors will start pointing towards the outside of the Mobius strip. So what that means is that this, this can't be assigned an orientation. And we can't use this kind of a surface when we talk about surface integrals. So what is an orientable surface? Well, like I said, it's a surface that basically has two sides to it. And because it has two sides, there are always two different options for how to assign an orientation to an orientable surface. And we're going to talk about how that, what that looks like. But here's an example of a surface with both orientations. In this case, the, uh, this orientation is defined um, by taking the normal vectors uh, to point up or out of this surface. Uh, this is, you can think of this as like the top, top side of this surface. And then the second option for the orientation, we make our normal vectors point downward or in towards this surface. Okay, so let's try to make this a little bit more precise now. Um, let's begin, first of all, with surfaces that are actually graphs of functions. So if you have a surface that's given in the form z equals some function of x and y, then from our work on finding uh, normal vectors in the past, uh, the vector, um, this, this guy up on top, negative uh, partial of g with respect to xi minus partial of g with respect to yj plus k, we know that this vector would be normal to the surface at that point. And then make, we also want it to be a unit vector, so we divide by the magnitude of that vector. This thing is what we define to be the unit normal to the surface at whatever point we plug into this. Now notice that the k component is positive here. It's, it's 1. So because it's positive, that means that the vectors that we're using for our unit normals are going to be pointing upwards, not necessarily straight up because we have a, a, a an i and a j component as well, but uh, more upwards than downwards. So that it would look more like this case than this case. Um, because of that, that, uh, that upward orientation, is, uh, or we... we uh, we think of that as what we call an upward orientation. 
So in, in case that term is um, unclear, if I use that later, that's what we're talking about. Um, in the event that the surface is not necessarily representable as a function of x and y, we instead work with a parametric surface and we define the normal vector to be uh, the unit vector in the direction of r u cross r v. Now, in this case, um, we make we d give some special terminology to what we call closed surfaces. So, uh, a closed surface is a surface that acts as the boundary of a solid. So, for example, this sphere is the boundary of the ball that's contained inside of it. Um, the uh, normal vector as we define it here will always assign an outward orientation in a case like this. Um, and that's because the uh, normal vectors will, will point in the direction of the, um, uh, in the case of a sphere anyways, point in the direction of the position vectors for each of these points. So this outward orientation is what we call a positive orientation. Um, if we choose the orientation for a surface that has the normal vectors pointing inward, which would be like assigning a negative to this, we just call it negative n usually, we call that negative orientation for that surface. Okay, So when we're talking about surface integrals and vector fields, we need to be thinking in terms of orientable surfaces. So let's go ahead and um, see if we can define this, this uh, concept of taking the surface integral of a vector field. In order to do this, we want to use um, a physical example, something from physics, to sort of motivate this definition. What we're going to do is consider a fluid of density rho, and rho is going to be a function of x, y, and z, because the density may vary depending on the fluid's position in three space. Um, and the fluid is moving according to a velocity field, which we're going to denote v of x, y, z. Um, now, the fluid is going to flow through an oriented surface, S, and it's important here to not think of S as a physical object, like a, like a uh, you know, like piece of paper or something like that, or a sail, or you know, something of, to that effect, because we don't want to think of the surface as something that would impede this, uh, the flow of this fluid. So your book tells you to think of S as kind of an invisible um, surface that's not acting as a barrier of any kind, and the fluid can flow th freely through it without without being impeded in any way. Um, and we're also going to let n denote the unit normal vector of s. Remember, this is a function because the unit normal has to take points of that are on s as inputs and assign normal vectors to those points. Um, the rate of flow of this fluid. Uh, in, in uh, the, the rate of flow would be measured in uh, units of mass per units of time, would be rho v. Uh, and that, that makes sense if you think of that in a physical context. So what we want to do is take this surface S and cut it into patches, partition it up into patches like we've been doing. And if you make these patches small enough, um, then they start to look like little pieces of a plane. They start to flatten out. So in those cases, we can approximate the mass of the fluid that passes through each patch per unit time, um, specifically in the direction of that normal vector, in the direction of n, by this little expression right here. Now this quantity, rho v, remember this is the rate of flow, and by dotting it with n, what we're doing is we're finding the component of the rate of flow in the n direction. Um, this right here, we're multiplying by the uh, area. In fact, let me, let me draw a little diagram to help you visualize this a little bit more. Let's suppose that this is um, Sij. This is my little patch. And notice it's, it's from a surface, but if we make it, if we cut the surface into enough patches, it's going to look almost planar, okay? And then if I look at a point here, um, let's suppose the velocity field is flowing this direction. Notice it's not necessarily perpendicular to the patch because the velocity field is independent of that surface. It's flowing wherever it's, wherever it's going. The normal vector may look like this. So here's V and here's N. Okay. Um, 
what we want is the rate of flow uh, in the direction of n. Now, even though the rate of flow is going this way, I can project v onto n, by, uh, which is basically finding the component of v in the direction of n by using this dot product. Now, that's at one point, but if you're looking at the rate of flow everywhere through this patch, then I can get the I can get the um, rate of flow uh, in mass per unit time by multiplying by the area of that patch. Okay, so that's what this quantity represents. Um, now, <clears throat> if I were to do this for all of the patches that we've partitioned our surface into, and then apply a limit to that to, to create an integral out of this, the surface integral would look like this. Um, and this this is the same thing as this, but just showing the x, y, z on each of these, since they are functions of x, y, and z. Okay, so we're, we're integrating this guy, but the area, which is, you can think of as like a delta s, i, j, becomes a ds in the, in the limiting case where I get that integral. Now, this is specific to uh, a fluid flow, but... Remember, the velocity field is just a vector field which represents the velocity of uh, points or particles in a fluid. Um, if I let capital F equal rho v, and then if I just think of F as any vector field, so not necessarily a velocity field, then we can generalize this definition um, to get the definition of a uh, surface integral of f over the surface s. And that's this. It's uh, the surface integral of f dot ds. When we see this notation, what it literally means is the surface integral of f dot n ds. Now notice the bold s here and the uh, capital but not bold s here. What this means is that we're treating this like a surface integral that we've already talked about. Um, f and n are both vector fields, but by taking their dot product, we get a scalar field. So this reduces to the service integral of a scalar field, which is what we've been doing up until this point in this section. We, uh, when you evaluate the surface integral uh, of a vector field over some surface s, what we call that is the flux of f across s. Flux represents that rate of uh, flow per unit time that we talked about through the through the entire surface s. Now, this you you definitely can use this to to do examples to do some computation, but as as usual, we like to come up with a um, a more practical method for finding uh, finding these surface integrals or whatever integral we're talking about um, in practice. So here. Working with the left-hand side of this, if I want to, uh, um, if if I have a parametrized surface S, then earlier we defined the normal vector n to be this quantity right here, um, cross product of R u with R v time uh, uh, normalized, so divided by its magnitude. Um, so I can uh, because f dot d s becomes f dot n d s. I can substitute this for the n. And then the ds, remember, turns into this, the absolute or the magnitude of the cross product of ru with rv dA. I get cancellation happening here. And so what that results in is a uh, another way of thinking of um, surface integrals of vector fields, which is this. I, I do f dot ru cross rv. Notice I don't need the magnitude anymore. It's just the cross product. Um, over d, which is the it's the parameter region that I'm integrating over. Okay, that was a lot. That was a lot. So we're going to do this one in the next video, but I want to at least set this up here. Um, for this example, we're going to evaluate a surface integral of uh, f dot ds, where f is this um, vector field, zi plus yj plus xk, and s is the helicoid that we have worked with before, given by this uh, parametrization, u cosine of v, u sine of v, uh, v. Um, when I typed this, I forgot to put the um, intervals for u and v, so I wrote them in. u goes from 0 to 1, v goes from 0 to pi. We'll figure this one out in the next video.